Welcome to a tanky market update from uh, DNB Markets. Today I'm uh, joined by Hugo de Stoop, the CEO of uh, Euronal. Welcome back, Hugo. It's great to have you here. Well, very good to, uh, to be here. Thank you very much for hosting me. And also our shipping analyst, Nikolai uh, Dyvik. And it's been quite an eventful start uh, to the year with uh, VLTC uh, being at uh, 100,000, then coming down quite sharply to uh, around the low 20s and, and recently bouncing back a little bit up to their uh, 30s. But uh, how would you explain the sharp decline, Hugo, that we have seen in the rates? And how would you guide investors on what's happening in the near term uh, future? Well, to the extent that we can uh, predict the rates, which is something that is always difficult uh, in our markets, of course. Uh, but uh, when you go back to uh, 2019, uh, we were saying in Q1, Q2 and Q3 that the market was getting tighter and tighter. So the supply and demand were more uh, in balance with each other. And that uh, resulted in a very strong Q4, which obviously was prolonged into Q1. And we saw rates that were around $100,000 a day. Uh, I think on average, obviously, it was a little bit lower than that. And then, unfortunately, we saw a sharp decline. But uh, you always need to uh, never forget that Q4 and Q1 are the winter quarters where we make most of the money. So we were anticipating to have lower rates for Q2 and Q3. And it was only brought a little bit more forward because of the coronavirus. And the last point that I would like to make uh, is uh, that the market is driven by sentiment. So very often it's excessive. So when it was at $100,000 a day, it was probably a little bit too excessive on the high side. And when it dropped to 20,000, it was probably a little bit too excessive on the low side. And now it seems to find some sort of a balance around 30,000, which is uh, where we have our break even uh, on a VLCC, for instance. Does it make sense, uh, Nikolai? Do you agree on Hugo's take? Yeah. I agree. It's uh, it's uh, it's hard to 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 guide on the near term future, but uh, the mark it's uh, I think it's attributable to, to the to the virus and the China uh, lockdown. Uh, and uh, with regards to to the future, I think you also start to see a lot of uh, quarantine on on vessels and queuing and congestion. Uh, and as the market balance is quite fine tuned, uh, then uh, that uh, that has an impact. And also China is gradually resuming uh, operations again. Yeah, that's that's correct. And it's if it's if it is uh, mostly due to, to the virus, I mean, let's not forget that we never make a lot of money in Q2 and Q3. So I wouldn't say that we don't really care about the rates that we're going to have. But what is very, very important for us is to have a good Q1 and a good Q4. And hopefully uh, we we and, and we believe that that the virus will be contained <coughs> by the next winter. Uh, a lot of uh, the people predict the same because the summer is supposed to be uh, the moment when the virus uh, sort of disappears. So if we have a good Q1, which we had, and a good Q4, then overall the year will be very good, regardless of what happened in Q2 and Q3. Yeah. We'll touch upon uh, the virus later in the sure. discussion, but uh, you also recently announced uh, the purchase of uh, three VLCCs uh, under construction with scrubbers. Uh, and it was a price well below the recent market quote. So uh, could you share some thoughts on both the price and the transaction? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I think that what, uh, what we've seen uh, recently when the market was uh, above $100,000 a day uh, was probably excessive. And we have seen uh, vessels being exchanged for uh, well above $100 million, uh, a clip or uh, per vessel. Uh, and at those price, I think that Eurona was uh, a bit reluctant to uh, uh, to play and to be a, a buyer of those vessels. Uh, so when we saw the opportunity to buy them at a lower price, which we found to be more in line with uh, the future and, and, and the prospect that we have when we will operate those ships, then we grabbed those opportunities. It is difficult to put a price uh, on vessels when they're still under construction, yeah. uh, especially when the market is very hot because people expect to make a lot of money uh, and that makes the difference between a prompt delivery, i.e. a ship that is already operational in the market, and a ship that you will get, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, nine months down the road, which is the case here. So you shouldn't compare completely what we bought forward uh, uh, to a, a prompt delivery. But obviously, uh, with the rates declining, then the prompt delivery became more of a liability than uh, a forward delivery because, as I said, we believe that the next winter will be good, but in the meantime, the market may not be that good. So that explains the difference in price. Uh, going forward, where the price will go, uh, it is again something that is uh, a little bit driven by sentiment. 
Um, if it stays where it is, uh, we'll continue to look at opportunities. Uh, if it goes back to the numbers that we saw previously, then uh, we will have to stop. Are there more ships in circulation for sale uh, or were those three like in a unique uh, opportunity that you that you grabbed? No, I think that there are there are a few more that are uh, uh, being presented for sale. I think that people uh, still consider that what we pay is below what the market uh, should be. Uh, we have a different uh, opinion, obviously, uh, as a buyer, uh, but we will see uh, where the next transaction uh, settles. Some people say it's going to be higher. Some people say it's going to be lower. Uh, let's see. But um, uh, we are definitely there to uh, to grab the opportunities as long as the price is correct in our eyes. Okay. Uh, it must 2019 must have been uh, uh, early early 19. It must have been quite frustrating. Uh, many inbounds on scrubbers. Uh, we saw IMO spreads uh, go high, and uh, but you were you know defending your position and taking your view and taking an alternative approach. And in hindsight, uh, I must admit that your strategy turned out to be quite successful. Uh, mm. You didn't have any scrubber off fire during Q4. You not incurred any capex, uh, and your hedge on the ULCC, uh, the price is still uh, in the money or the yeah. fuel you bought with the current price after the collapse in, in prices. Uh, so, but now spreads are depending region, 150 uh, Singapore, 120 probably Rotterdam on the IMO fuel spread today. Uh, uh, so in hindsight, you've been successful, uh, but now of course there's a new set of opportunity. Is, is Scrubber now something you would take advantage of to install when off-hire costs are low? Well, um, I think it's so far the, the, the strategy that we applied has been successful, but we need to be very careful about the future and, and the spread will determine whether uh, it is right or wrong to a retrofit of Scrubber. We just purchased three vessels which are uh, Scrubber equipped and, and we see that uh, as an option, you know, uh, if the spread is there, then we'll use the scrubber. If the spread is not there, which I doubt, uh, we may not have to use the scrubber. Um, I think it's a very different value proposal uh, from a retrofit because the retrofit is more expensive. And indeed, you're taking your ship out of a, a market in order to retrofit. Uh, if the market is, uh, is, is lower or as low as it is today, obviously, uh, the loss uh, the opportunity cost is, is lower as well. Uh, and you may do that. And in addition, we have 16 ships that will go to dry dock. So what we have done is uh, study, uh, because the planning is, is what takes the most time, in fact. So we've studied how to do uh, uh, retrofitting of scrubber on those vessels that are going to a dry dock this year. Uh, we haven't pushed the button because we are still monitoring the evolution of the spread. And that's very important because we don't want to be speculative about it. In other words, we would like to lock in that spread. How do we lock in that spread? We can buy the HSFO today at today's price and we can lock in the LSFO pricing using the forward curve because there is no much more liquidity than what we saw in the past. And that's what we were waiting for. At the moment, we don't see that uh, spread, I mean, certainly in the forward curve, as being enough to justify a retrofit. That's the reason why we haven't uh, pushed on the button. Are we going to do that later this year? We are certainly prepared to do that, but uh, we will see at that time. So we could, <coughs> if you manage to lock in a spread, for what duration uh, would you see? So if you manage to lock in, we could expect probably 16 retrofits uh, for your now. If you manage to lock in the yeah, you we would probably not do that on Suez Max uh, because there we I mean, we have no certainty, but there the spread needs to be even higher or longer in uh, in time, and and so I cannot answer for how long because it depends yeah. for uh, how much the spread is. Uh, so we would focus on on the VLCCs, and if we look at the VLCC, we'll probably focus on the VLCCs that are non-echo. So it's not the full sixteen ships we have identified. Uh, eight ships, in fact, uh, which could be candidate uh, to do that. Uh, but again, this is this is a, a decision that we have not taken yet. But we need to be fully prepared because, as you know, uh, optionality in shipping is uh, is the best way to make money. Yeah. So on our numbers, half the VLCCs that were scheduled to retrofit, about 190 in total, about half of it uh, have currently been retrofitted. Mm -hmm. uh, some are stuck at the scrubby yard. Uh, uh, could we expect a similar, uh, like a large off hire uh, during the second and third quarter, both as a catch up for the Q1 uh, call it loss and, and then uh, that could lead to call it a uh, large off hire during the summer and potentially a spike in rates or what's your take on that? 
I think that you will see uh, some of fires and, and you will see the majority of those ships that have been scheduled for retrofit uh, undergoing their retrofit because they've placed the order uh, and they've probably paid the installments and they've uh, booked the yards. So they will go and take their ships to yard. I think that the delays that we've seen last year should be reduced because uh, um, the yards have more experience. Uh, but of course, the, the coronavirus has extended those delays because not all the workers came back to the to yards. But I doubt that today, if people have the choice of taking their ships to the yard, given the circumstance, they would do so. So we expect that to happen later in the year indeed uh, and to have a positive impact uh, on the market. But I wouldn't say uh, rates spiking. It will help uh, in an environment where the world is consuming less energy. So I wouldn't call that a, a spike and I wouldn't get too excited about it. I think it would just uh, limit the damages that we are seeing at the moment. Okay. So let's get back to uh, the virus. I mean, we touched upon it, but uh, what would you say are your uh, main concerns regarding this and, and what impact it could have on the tank market? I mean, first of all, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, human life uh, and we always need to be careful and, and, and we have taken a, a lot of uh, uh, precaution inside the office, but also in our operation on board the, the ships. Uh, we have no ships on, on quarantine and to a certain extent we have not seen a lot of tankers uh, being taken in quarantine simply because there's not a lot of exchange uh, between human beings. So you can perfectly take a VLCC or a Suez Max to a terminal. But is it likely that we will see ships uh, quarantined? Well, we've seen it in other segments, so that, that, that was a little bit my point, that you can take a, a tanker uh, to a terminal and you can load or discharge without having any human interaction because all of, uh, all of it can go through the, the, the piping and, and uh, the technology. So uh, from that uh, point of view, I don't believe that you will see a lot of tankers uh, being uh, put in quarantine, which is not the same in smaller size or uh, even in uh, other segments. Um, so from, from that point of view, we don't, we don't expect to see a lot of disruption. Now, obviously uh, what the virus did to the world, starting with China, is to slow down the economy because people were banned on travels and we see that it's coming up uh, in the Western world now. Yep. Uh, a lot of the economy was at a standstill uh, and that obviously uh, has an impact on the energy demand of which crude oil is part of. So we anticipate and we are seeing that now uh, on, on the rates that we are booking for our vessels that this lower energy demand is, means lower cargoes to be uh, transported. And we, we believe that the impact of that will be felt for the next two quarters. Uh, there is always a delay. I mean, when uh, after Chinese New Year, when, when, when China sort of stopped, there was a lot of cargo still bringing or still en route to bring the oil to China. And obviously they went there and they discharged it. So we are seeing now the first impact of having lower cargoes being transported to China. Uh, and, and God knows that they have probably uh, filled up their uh, storage because on the consumption side, it's much lower than uh, what we are used to see in the world, in a normal world, I would say. The good news, uh, if there is a good news, is that uh, those viruses usually get contained. So there's a peak at a certain point and then uh, there's a reduction. Uh, it seems to be uh, 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 linked to the seasonality that uh, it happens uh, in the summer. Uh, hopefully we'll find a, a vaccine or certainly treatments uh, uh, in the near term. And that's why we are hopeful that the next winter, which is very important for us, um, the virus impact would have disappeared and the world would go back to normal. Could there be other potential consequences? Uh, I mean, for example, Nikolai, less order of ships. Yeah, I think at least uh, one of the <clears throat> I think one of the main reasons why you've seen an optimism in tankers is the, the limited order book. Uh, we calculate that you have about 70 VLCCs in the order book and that's same as you saw deliveries in 2019. And uh, we calculate at least that there are about 70 VLCCs which will become either 20, 22 and a half or 25 years of age over the next three years, uh, which are uh, in service and not in storage. Since if you count those ships in storage, you actually get a higher number. So you have already called it uh, a balance between order book and scrapping candidates. Uh, so uh, a, a, a short term, uh, call it rate dip, if that's what we're going to see, uh, then, uh, then um, uh, that could slow the order intake. But I think the order intake is slow due to the propulsion risk uh, and uncertainty with regards to climate. But I think we're going to touch upon that uh, at the end. Yeah. And I, I mean, still, it, it's, it's still early days. And, and we must admit, this is very, very hard, if not 
near impossible to predict how this will play out. Completely, completely agree. Yeah, but it's uh, I mean just to uh, to rebound on what uh, Nikolai just mentioned, um, we are probably more optimistic on the, the recycling of uh, of ships uh, than on the order book. Uh, the order book we're going to touch on it in the, in a minute. Uh, is limited at the moment, is likely to be limited in, in the future. But where we get very, uh, very much excited is that even if uh, a few more orders were to be placed, there is enough candidates uh, to, be, to be recycled, to be uh, sent to the scrapyards uh, uh, on, a, on a yearly basis. So it's not only this year that there's a good number of vessels hitting the 20 or 22 and a half years uh, of age. It's also next year and the years to come. And that is a fundamental uh, change that we saw compared to the last decade, where on average the, the fleet was very young and there was not enough uh, old ships, i.e. candidates, to be taken out of the fleet to rebalance uh, the fleet when necessary. Yeah. Um, in, in your last appearance here in October, uh, you, you said that uh, the underlying market has to be very tight uh, for rates to be that high. And uh, in our research, uh, we have cal calculated that actually Tom oil demand in 19 was not that good. It was actually negative. Uh, that's our numbers. Uh, uh, and that actually supply disruptions, either Iranian storage, IMO fuel storage, or Costco uh, sanctions, uh, scrubber retrofits, accounted for about a 6% year-over-year increase in utilization in 19. So, so how, how to think about uh, Tom oil demand uh, also in light of, of, uh, of, uh, of probably today's... Uh, uh, OPEC meeting uh, and uh, the supply disruptions. Yeah, um, it, it's true that we have different numbers on ton miles, and we believe that they were positive uh, uh, last year. But um, <coughs> is, that, is that very much the point? I think that fundamentally, uh, you're seeing more cargoes uh, uh, leaving the Atlantic. I would say uh, certainly the US uh, and Brazil and going to the Far East, and we saw uh, an acceleration in 19 of that. Uh, and certainly for IMO 2020, which requires low sulfur, uh, uh, we also saw a, an acceleration of, of the demand on, on this type of fuel. And every time you had a, an OPEC cut, uh, it seems that uh, the cut was compensated by uh, oil coming from uh, the US, Brazil, or, or at least that, that part of the, the world, which fundamentally is good for us because it's longer distance. So in addition to that, we had a lot of disruption. Totally agree. Uh, but when you look at uh, different years, you very often have disruptions in our market. I mean, we are being influenced by geopolitical events all the time. Uh, sanctions are being put on, on different countries all the time. And some of those disruptions uh, are very much the same that what we anticipate to see this year, with the exception of Costco. Uh, but let's not forget that uh, the Costco sanctions, so the sanctions being put on a number of ships uh, owned by Costco, uh, was very much part of a trade agreement. And they've reached uh, an agreement at least on phase one, and we expect uh, phase two and potentially phase three to also happen. And uh, part of the phase one was uh, the requirement for China to buy a certain amount of energy, $50 billion uh, uh, dollar worth of energy from the US. So that should help as well. We will need to see whether that is replacement, so the, uh, the oil or the energy was going to Japan and Korea will be replaced by China, or whether that will be in addition to what was already being exported to the Far East. And, and that should be positive for the ton mine. So I think that um, every year you need to analyze what's going on in the market. But again, if there were to be an oversupply for more than just the summer, I think that there's enough candidates to be recycled and to rebalance the market relatively quickly. And again, that's what we didn't have in the previous decade. And that's why, why we had a crisis that were longer in time than uh, what we could wish for. Yeah. And in my view, you, probably the scrapping candidates, as they reach 20, 22 and a half and 25, uh, it's not actually a problem alternative to be in the market any longer. Well, it's, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a different time because not only do you have to pay for the dry dock and when it's an older vessel, uh, the capex that you have to spend uh, into the dry dock needs, uh, well, is usually higher than, than for a younger vessel. Obviously, it's like a car. An old car will require more maintenance than a young car. Uh, in addition, they need to put a, a water uh, ballast treatment system, which in itself will cost probably one and a half uh, million. So that's in addition to your regular capex and you need to amortize that over the re remaining life of the ship. So if your ship is old, 
then there's very little time to amortize that. So it's another incentive to go and recycle your uh, ship at a time when the scrap prices are uh, still uh, favorable to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> the OPEC meeting is uh, today and uh, um it has been recommended an additional output cut of uh, 1 million barrels uh, a day. Uh, what do you think the impact would be on the tank tanky market if this uh, materializes? Well, an OPEC cut is usually uh, never a good thing for the tanker market. I mean, let's be honest, uh, we would prefer to have uh, much more oil uh, flowing the market and, and, and required to be transported. Uh, but it's true that what we have seen in the last two or three years is that whenever there was an OPEC cut, uh, there was compensation of that cut for uh, oil being produced somewhere else on the planet and that somewhere else was favorable to uh, the tanker market. I think that this cut is very much addressing a temporary problem and the temporary problem is what we discussed. It's related to the virus. Uh, the energy demand today in the world is lower than uh, what we have in uh, normal circumstances. Uh, because people uh, you know, are banned from traveling and, uh, and obviously a lot of goods are not being moved either. Um, but it's temporary. And, uh, and again, we believe that it's going to be temporary for uh, Q2, potentially Q3. So we're talking about six months and those six months are in the summer. So we believe that there's going to be a negative impact on the market. But that is the negative impact that we would have had anyway. And if they don't cut, what will tend to happen is that the oil will be produced, uh, not consumed, will be stored. And then anyway, that could be negative later on. So we frankly prefer that they cut today and that there is no uh, rising in uh, the, uh, the storage of oil so that we can look, uh, look out for a good winter uh, this year. And we'll see, right? We'll get the answer uh, later today. Absolutely. Did you as well see the video uh, yesterday from uh, how they greet at the OPEC meeting? They do it uh, the Chinese way now. They don't shake hands, but with the legs. Okay, well, uh, I, I, I didn't see that video, but I saw a video of uh, the uh, President Maduro from Venezuela uh, telling the people how they should greet each other. It's, uh, it's a very good one. I recommend it to you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think the ne next question you could probably answer in half an hour, but if you were to be <laughs> limited to, to like a minute or two, uh, decarbonization in shipping has become a hot topic. Uh, and uh, and uh, how do you uh, uh, go about to, to meet uh, the IMO requirements? Yeah, I mean, it's a very important topic for everyone, uh, and in particular for Euronav. Uh, we're certainly uh, trying uh, and willing to take the lead on that. Uh, we're part of different coalitions. We're a member of the Global Maritime Forum. We're part of the uh, Getting to Zero Coalition, uh, which uh, aims at producing a, a commercial ship with zero emission by 2030. So that's way before and way more ambitious than what the IMO is requiring. Uh, concretely, what does that mean? I mean, concretely, for the things that we have already seen or done in the past, uh, all those requirements from IMO uh, are benchmarked from 2008. So we have a, a requirement to reduce the, the carbon emission or the efficiency of the ships by 40% uh, between uh, 2008 and 2030. Since 2013, there, is, uh, there has been the production of the eco ships, and those eco ships are already far more efficient than the previous uh, generation. So you can talk about 20, <coughs> maybe a little bit more than 20% uh, CO2 reduction out of the 40 that we need to meet. Uh, the latest generation ship, and certainly the three that we bought, seems to be even more efficient by uh, another three, four, five percent. So having a modern fleet is very important if you want to meet uh, the IMO requirement. Uh, as this requirement is for 2030, you can already anticipate that the ships that are between 10 and 15 years of age today will anyway be phased out before we reach 2030. So the generation of ships that, is, that has been built and will continue to be built uh, maybe uh, uh, at the moment is already more than halfway meeting the requirement. Uh, then the rest of uh, how do we meet the rest of the requirement? Uh, simply, we can reduce the speed, reduce the power. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Uh, according to our estimate, uh, we can probably, by reducing by one knot on the super eco ships, we can already meet the requirement. So that's a, a relatively positive news. Uh, and then we have also uh, at Euronav invested in uh, uh, what I would call technology, I mean digitalization, where we have uh, better software to help 
the guys on board routing uh, the vessels through currents, weather, uh, wind, uh, and all these kind of things, and making sure that they never waste energy. The last thing that we would like to do, uh, but that requires a lot of cooperation with a lot of people, is uh, to go back to what we call the virtual arrival. Because when it comes to wasting energy, that's where we waste the most energy. And the simple example of that is when you arrive uh, in Rotterdam, I was visiting one of our ships the other day, uh, the ship had been waiting for 10 days. Uh, so why do you uh, speed up in order to arrive and wait to discharge the cargo? That's completely stupid. Um, that requires a lot of cooperation with our clients and with the terminals. And there is economics behind it because it's whether you're going to uh, um, get the demerge or wh whether you're going to get the savings of not consuming uh, the, car, the, um, uh, the fuel. In today's world, the good thing is that people are putting a lot of attention onto the CO2. So that debate is a mix of economic debate and pollution debate. So there is room for having that discussion with our partners, be it the client or the terminals. So we're very much looking forward to try uh, and be a leader uh, in that initiative as well. But that should, be, that should lead the industry certainly to meet the requirements of 2030. For the longer term requirements, 2050, that obviously will require different fuel and, uh, and hopefully fuels that don't emit uh, any CO2. It sounds like we can make a full episode just yeah. on this uh, <laughs> subject, probably. Okay, I think that uh, wraps it up. Uh, thank you again, Hugo, for uh, joining us. Always uh, interesting and relevant to get your take on what's happening in uh, the market. So uh, thank you and uh, thank you for watching. Thank you.